Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on quantum mechanics. In the previous video, we provided a mathematical formalism for the wave function via Hilbert spaces. In this video, we will continue our analysis of the wave function by discussing perhaps the most important topic for truly understanding QM at an intuitive level, the intricate link between linear algebra and quantum mechanics. As this will be a slightly longer video, I highly recommend you really take the time to learn this content, as it will make all lectures later on much more intuitive. Before we get into analyzing linear algebra in the context of QM, we should establish some notation which is absolutely necessary for understanding the entirety of this course. In quantum mechanics, we typically express linear algebra terminology in terms of what is known as bra-ket notation. A ket is written as follows, and is used to denote an element of a Hilbert space. In finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, this simply denotes a column vector. In infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, we can instead treat a ket as a continuous function, like our position wave function. A bra is denoted as follows, and is an element of the dual of a given Hilbert space, which corresponds to a map from kets to scalars, in this case, complex numbers. For finite dimensional spaces, this really just amounts to being the conjugate transpose of the equivalent ket column vector, giving us a row vector. However, for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, this definition is a little bit more involved. To understand how we can arrive at this definition, we first note that bras and kets can be combined to form an inner product as follows. In the finite dimensional case, we simply get the product of a row and column vector, which just amounts to a Euclidean or lowercase l2 inner product. However, for the continuous case, this becomes a capital L2 inner product, given by the following integral. Consequently, we have that a bra in the infinite dimensional setting amounts to a functional that maps a given ket function to a scalar via the following integral. Just like in linear algebra, where we can apply matrices against vectors, in quantum mechanics, we will equivalently apply operators to kets and bras. We simply denote this by putting the operator beside the ket or bra as follows. You may be wondering how we apply an operator Q to a bra. Well, in general, we have that this is simply given as the bra of the Hermitian conjugate, also known as the Hermitian adjoint, Q dagger of the operator Q on the ket represented by the bra, where we define the Hermitian conjugate as follows. For continuous functions, these operators usually take the form of some combination of functions and differential operators. While we will encounter many types of operators in this course, there is one specific type that I want to focus on in this video. Thus far, I have referred to the operators we have worked with, namely position and momentum, as observables. You may be wondering what this term actually means. Well, intuitively, it refers to quantities that we can measure but there's also a rigorous mathematical definition behind the term. In particular, an operator is an observable if it is self-adjoint, meaning that it is equal to its Hermitian adjoint. In finite dimensional spaces, these are simply referred to as Hermitian matrices. Technically, it is not proper to refer to infinite dimensional self-adjoint operators as Hermitian, but I will use the terms interchangeably for this course. I'll leave it as an exercise to show that x and p are actually both Hermitian operators, and this can just be done trivially using integration by parts and simple algebraic manipulation. If you've ever taken a linear algebra course, you're probably familiar with the notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Essentially, the idea is that we are interested in the values of x and lambda for x not equal to zero that the following statement holds, where A is some linear operator, which in finite dimensional spaces is just a matrix. If a matrix is diagonalizable, we can decompose it into three operations, wherein we first change the basis from the center basis to the eigenbasis, scale each eigenvector accordingly via this diagonal matrix, and then transform back into the standard basis. Eigen decompositions, or spectral decompositions as they are often called in QM, have countless applications and uses beyond linear algebra and physics that I won't go into here. One nice property to remember, though, is that for diagonalizable matrices, we can write the power of a matrix using the same decomposition, but simply taking the corresponding power of the diagonal matrix. 
Notably, this means that if a function f is analytic, meaning that it admits a Taylor series expansion, we have that f of some matrix A that's diagonalizable is simply given as follows. This statement is known as Sylvester's formula. Anyways, getting back to the topic at hand, you may be wondering how eigenvalues and eigenvectors, or eigenstates as they are known in QM, correspond to quantum mechanics. To understand this link, consider eigenvalues and eigenvectors for observables. For any observable, the set of values that we could possibly get when performing a measurement is described by the spectrum or set of eigenvalues of the operator. For instance, position and momentum have continuous spectra from negative infinity to positive infinity, meaning that any one of these values is an allowed measurement outcome in general. On the other hand, the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom has quantized or discrete energy levels, meaning that these are the only allowed energy levels. We cannot measure anything in between these energies. Eigenstates of an observable correspond to states with fixed measurement outcomes, meaning that measuring the corresponding observable for this state will always return the same measurement outcome each time and leave the state unchanged. For instance, the 1s orbital is an energy eigenstate of the hydrogen atom, meaning that this state has a fixed energy. By introducing the notion of eigenstates, we can actually formalize what it means to measure something. In particular, measuring an observable means that we randomly project the given state onto one of the eigenstates of the given observable. If our spectrum is discrete, the probability of projecting our original state onto a given eigenstate is given by the absolute value of their inner product squared. If the spectrum is continuous, this simply gives a probability density instead. Consequently, under this definition, if our wave function is already an eigenstate of a given operator, measuring said operator will always project it onto itself, leaving the wave function unchanged. As I stated previously, eigenstates correspond to measurement outcomes. As it turns out, we can prove that observables share a complete set of eigenstates if and only if they commute. This implies that we can only perform simultaneous measurement of two observables if and only if they commute with each other. Such observables are referred to as compatible observables. As we saw in the last episode, position and momentum do not commute, meaning that these observables cannot be measured simultaneously with exact accuracy. We express this uncertainty in terms of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. As it turns out, however, for any two operators A and B, we can derive a more general form of this inequality, as shown here. To derive this bound, we simply write the definitions of the variance of A and B in bra ket notation as follows. Define these kets in the inner product as F and G, respectively. Using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, we can obtain the following lower bound. We can then lower bound the absolute value of this inner product squared by the absolute value of the imaginary part squared, which we can write as follows. Evaluating each of these inner product terms separately, we can do some algebraic manipulation to get the following. Substituting these back into the original expression then gives us the bound we desired to show. It should also be noted that self-adjoint operators have nice properties when it comes to their eigenvalues and eigenstates. Firstly, we have that any self-adjoint operator has real eigenvalues, which makes sense since I already explained that these self-adjoint operators correspond to quantities that we can measure, meaning that they must have real measurement outcomes. Additionally, we have that self-adjoint operators always have orthogonal eigenvectors. Note that if the spectrum is degenerate, we can always choose an orthogonal eigenbasis. Since these states are orthogonal, this effectively means that all the eigenstates have no overlap in their projections, meaning that they can always be perfectly distinguished from each other. If we scale each eigenstate accordingly, we can get an orthonormal eigenbasis. The definition of orthonormality differs for discrete versus continuous spectra. For discrete spectra, we define orthonormality to mean that the inner product of two eigenstates is the Kronecker delta, which is 1 when both eigenstates are the same and 0 when they differ. For continuous spectra, we instead define orthonormality to mean that the inner product of the two states is the Dirac delta of the difference of the two parameters, used to parameterize the eigenstates. 
the Dirac delta is not a function, but rather a type of distribution or generalized function, which can be thought of as being effectively zero everywhere where the argument is non-zero, and then plus infinity when the argument is zero. This function is normalized such that its integral from negative infinity to positive infinity is 1. The Dirac delta is really only well defined when we integrate it against something, in which case we have the following relation. I would highly recommend you keep this property in mind since it tends to show up in a lot of different fields. Using the orthogonality of Hermitian eigenstates, we can actually write the special decomposition of a Hermitian operator as follows in bra ket notation. Note here that Sylvester's formula can also be written as follows. This will become important in later videos, where we discuss how to convert Hermitian operators into unitary operators by taking complex exponentials of these Hermitian operators. You may have noticed that I use a special operator when writing the spectral decomposition. If I apply this to a given test state f, some simple rearranging shows that this gives us the component of the test state f along the state xi times the state xi itself. In other words, this operator is a projection operator, giving the projection of the state f onto the given eigenstate. If we sum together multiple orthogonal projection operators, we get a projection operator for the subspace spanned by the composite vectors. Consequently, summing over a complete set of vectors that spans the Hilbert space simply gives us the identity operator, which leaves any state unchanged. If our complete set of vectors is continuous rather than discrete, we can instead write this condition as the following integral. Let's try and compute eigenstates for some of the familiar operators we have defined. Consider the momentum operator, which we defined as follows in position space. We simply get a first order differential equation, which we can solve as follows, to get that the eigenstates of the momentum operator are given by these plane waves. We usually add this additional normalization factor as well to get the following definition of the eigenstates, based on the Dirac orthogonality condition explained previously. Note that since P is a Hermitian operator, we have that its eigenvalues are real, meaning that P0 can be any real number, as there are no additional restrictions on the allowed eigenvalues. Furthermore, notice that this function is actually not normalizable over the entire x-axis since it does not vanish as we go to plus or minus infinity, meaning that it is not a physically realizable wave function. This effectively shows that if we have a state with defined momentum, it is impossible to define its position, so as not to contradict the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You may be wondering what the position eigenfunctions are. Well, this can be answered intuitively based on the fact that the eigenfunctions have known positions, meaning that the amplitude must be entirely concentrated at a single location. Hence, we infer that the position eigenstates are given as Dirac delta expressions. Note that these expressions are not square integrable, but just ignore this for now. As a result of this, though, we can observe that psi of x can actually be written as the following inner product, where this x state denotes an x eigenstate. In fact, this actually holds true for any operator A with a continuous spectrum. Thus far, we have assumed that our wave function is defined over position space. However, we can define it in other bases such as momentum, energy, or angular momentum eigenstates using projection operators. Suppose we have a complete set of discrete energy eigenstates for the Hamiltonian operator H. We can change the basis of our wave function by applying the sum over all projection operators for the eigenstates of H to get the following expansion in terms of the energy basis. You may be wondering how to evaluate these coefficients in the linear combination. Well, this simply is based on how we are given the original wave function. If the original wave function is in the energy basis itself, this just reduces down to a simple lowercase l2 inner product. However, if we are given the wave function in position form, we simply use the identity in terms of position projection operators to get the following integral definition of the coefficients. If we instead have a continuous set of complete eigenstates, we can do change of basis as follows. For instance, if we want to write our wave function in terms of momentum, we can do the following expansion. If our original wave function is given in terms of position, we can do an additional expansion as follows. 
If we now use the momentum eigenstate computed previously, as well as the Dirac orthogonality relation, we arrive at the following expression for the momentum wave function in terms of the position wave function. You may have heard of a mathematical operation known as the Fourier transform. This operation transforms a function in the time domain into its decomposition in the frequency domain. And similarly, it transforms a function in position space into its decomposition in the wave vector, or in this case, wave number domain, as we are working in one dimension. Hence, using the fact that momentum is h bar times the wave vector, we have the following relation between the two spaces. In momentum space, the definitions of the momentum and position operators effectively swap, where we define the momentum as just p, and then define the position x as the following differential in p. Note the lack of a minus sign here in the definition of x, unlike what we have for the momentum operator in the position basis. All our definitions for expectation value and whatnot still hold as we defined them previously, except now we integrate over dp rather than dx. One thing you may be curious about then is how the momentum eigenstate looks like in this momentum basis. Interestingly, what you will find is that taking the Fourier transform of this complex exponential actually yields the following Dirac delta expression, just as we inferred in the position case. Furthermore, as you might expect, the position eigenstate in the momentum basis is also given as a plane wave, but with opposing direction. Consequently, to transform momentum wave function back into position space, all we need to do is apply the same transform as before, but flip the sign of the complex exponent, effectively performing the inverse Fourier transform. Altogether, we define the broadcast notation scheme and introduce several key linear algebra concepts that will be indispensable to us going forward. In the next video, we will continue our discussion on energy eigenstates by introducing both the time-dependent and time-independent versions of Schrodinger's equation. I hope you enjoy this video, and I'll see you next time.